Hello everyone, welcome to Volume 3 of the Atomnus. I'm Charles Zibdis, and today I'm going to be talking about splatterpunks. Now, so far, I think I've read about six or seven stories from the compendium. And I have to say, some of them have been truly painful, and some have been genuine delights for me. For example, I should first I should correct myself, because it turns out that uh, God damn it! What's his name? Uh, Richard Christian Matheson is not Richard Matheson of I Am Legend and Hell House fame. He is his son, and uh, although he happens also to be uh, a writer for television, he's by far one of the most stylistically acceptable writers in this anthology that I've read so far. I've just finished up a couple of really terrible stories that I could hardly get through and I'm just on the cusp of reading the big George R. R. Martin piece which I can already see by flipping through it is subdivided into Roman numeral and regular numeral chapters and sub chapters and parts you can tell this guy you know what I'm not gonna bag on George R. R. Martin but I'll tell you something right now I want a bag on him, <laughs> but that's not what this is about. So let's get right down to it. There are a few important things that I think have been cleared up for me about the splatterpunks and why they're important to this aesthetic manifesto. First and foremost, they are very aware of um, a, a a paradigm shift of what horror was and what it should be now although I don't necessarily agree with where they're aiming their sights but I think there have been a few things that I personally really appreciated uh, I'm not gonna look at the book and read them uh, word for word because I don't want to try to quote other texts too heavily but what I can say is that in the introduction to one of the authors the editor said of him that, or quoted him saying something along the lines of, um, there are new monsters now, and it's time, it's time we all saw them, and it turns out the monsters are ourselves, and that's a, that's an extremely cliched thing to say, but at least he's looking for monsters that aren't werewolves or zombies or, uh, vampires. But, uh, I would I would say that the monsters aren't necessarily ourselves, although um, people can be a great source of horror on a daily basis. I can attest to that uh, just based on my past three or four days. But I think situations themselves can be monsters. I think a, a series of details clustered together in a room and tied together by a single consciousness can can itself something as immaterial as that can become a monster and and can uh, can truly haunt a person it can menace a person um, I think I think for example this crumb of cake that that rests on my uh, desk here covered in translucent green colored sugar flakes uh, is, is, a, is a great monster, it's a great horror that I'm beholding at the moment. Um, and the reason why that's a horror to me is because it just so happens that I've been surviving on matzo crackers and old parboiled Mexican rice that's been sitting in the back of my cabinet for God knows how long, two to three years. And uh, I, I swear to God, I've eaten nothing but rice and uh, for the past three days, cake for the past uh, five or six days. Um, and the reason for that is I'm facing a lot of financial difficulties as a result of uh, the VA's unjust truncation of my funds. But I won't go into that. I just want to point out that a person a person can silently fall into this situation uh, escaping the notice of everybody that person knows and this person 
can uh, can be trapped in in this circumstance and, and find it inescapable that is a horrifying thing the fact that the reason why I've been eating cake for the past three days, which by the way has been a real treat, icingless cake from a box of cake mix I found on top of my fridge that was sitting in a plastic bin full of half-eaten sweets that are there from the days of uh, a long lost relationship. Um, that was a treat because I, ha I scraped up enough money from change and one of the drawers in this curio cabinet I keep on my dresser to go to the coin star at the local Weiss grocery store and get a voucher to uh, withdraw some cash from the cashier's register and go back into the store and buy a, a carton of eggs with which I, I baked myself a cake um, a very dry dry cake and um, uh, I'm not, uh, there are other details that I just have too much decorum at the moment. I'm not saying in general, but at least at the moment to actually describe. One of them I'm uh, very aware of because I'm still physically sensing it within my body. Uh, but these are horrors. These, these situations, these circumstances uh, coagulate and, and form the outline of a new, previously undiscovered monster and a previously undiscovered phantasm from the darkest depths of human experience. Uh, now that's extremely pessimistic and realistic and maybe even a little bit boring, you know? I think a, a big part of uh, the literary or at least the creative tradition of being creatively horrifying, uh, uh, it's I think it's widely regarded as something that is meant to entertain and to divert the mind from other horrors that they're going to be facing as soon as they look away from the, a page in a book or uh, a, a screen in a movie theater <clears throat> or in your bedroom. But I think that we can just as easily look at real life horrors dead on and give them a new mythological, uh, taxonomical form and uh, give them new two-part Latin nomenclatures and uh, I think the menagerie of terror that's waiting in the wings from uh, a primordial soup such as this one um, it's unfathomable, it's, it's simply going to swallow uh, souls whole if anyone ever catches on to what I'm getting at here. Now I've come to grips with why I've had difficulties in the past really expressing myself when speaking in this way about these things that I'm trying to explain and, and seal within this video manifesto. And the bottom line, I've come to appreciate and accept it is that what I'm talking about, which I'm becoming painfully aware I have not given a title yet, and that's something that I will have to do eventually, and I aim to do within this series, uh, it is by its very nature unproducible in a series of um, dialectical words. What I would have to do, and what I am doing, and what I will continue to do to convey what I'm talking about is to actually write stories and actually make videos and when my album comes out on the 1st of October and I really hope there will be people who want to listen to it and are actually waiting to hear it because I've worked hard on it. Um, the album. You'll have to actually hear the album. What I can do right now to satisfy some of what I'm working hard to produce is I can read a dream I had two nights ago and 
use that as a as a beginning descriptor for exactly what I'm talking about. So let me go get my dream journal and I'll be right back. Son of a bitch. Now this is my dream journal. I've been writing in this thing since the year 2010. And here's uh, what you'll be greeted with if you open up the first page. But it's been many years since that first page was cracked open, many years since this ground was broken. The pages have been stained with a frantic hand since then. But this dream hails from the night of September 23rd, 2015. A complex of structures nestled in the ruins of exit ramp territory in Montgomery, Alabama. Collectively, they are known as Riviera. I have the distinct feeling of having been visited by this image before. First, there is a dugout wall supported by a vast slab of concrete on which the letters for Riviera are spelled out. Within this alcove, whose inner side faces a monstrous advance of kudzu, there is what appears to be an ultra-modern cafe slash diner with a flat elliptical roof and a brushed metal exterior. The tall window panes are tinted in a near-opaque black. No cars are parked in the parking lot. Then it appears that I am in a car, driving alongside this complex on an empty highway. I discover as we pull past that there is a structure just after the viral swath of kudzu that is so large and imposing on the landscape that I can feel my heart commit a momentary sputter. The facade appears to be a combination of conical chambers with rounded spherical bottoms. In all, the building must be 15 stories tall, at least. The exterior of this building is also made of warped square panels of brushed metal. Some panels have popped out of their jointings. Others are woefully stained like rotten teeth in an otherwise utopian mouth. It is my father driving the car. As we gain distance away from Riviera, I see that the surrounding landscape remains flat, grassy, and largely undeveloped. We drift under an interstate off-ramp, and I say something like, If I had known this was here, hell, I would have spent some of my childhood in Montgomery. My father gives vague signs of acknowledgement as the Riviera shrinks on the horizon. Now that might have seemed a little purple. In my defense, I had slept on the couch and just woken up and ran into my bedroom to scribble those details down because I've been having trouble remembering my dreams and I used to enjoy a, a wealth of dream memory and, and, a, and a very rich and complicated series of lucid dreams. But I think the imagery here is really important to what I'm trying to describe. You have this sense of something that has been once so vast and so central to such a, a, a primitive population, especially since we're talking about Montgomery, Alabama. Now have no illusions and try not to be a social justice warrior about every single thing that crosses your path. Let's, let's be serious here. Montgomery, Alabama is a serious shithole. It's a, it's a blight on the face of this planet Earth. But it's also one of the most fertile towns I've ever spent a significant amount of time in. And it's no surprise to me that such a tragic, decrepit, inviting, and treacherous scene as this, as this Riviera, as it was pointedly named in my dream, would exist in the middle of this completely unpeopled, uh, I don't know what to call it, a meadow, this, this weird uh, off-ramp, crossed nightmare plot of ground. This, if you can think of it for what it is based on what I just read to you, is a large part 
of exactly the kind of new horror I'm putting forth. And um, I, w I want us to consider this going ahead because one of the great things about autumn and October and the Halloween season is the feeling, the comfortable feeling of your own destitution. I'm going to use a very solid example here. Uh, a slightly bitter chill has crept into the air. Most of the leaves are dead and on the ground. Everything seems orange, brown, and red, the traditional colors of fall. Your father or one of your parents is driving you around in a not-so-nice vehicle. Um, you've stopped at a gas station because you're on the road on a long road trip. Well, maybe not too long. Maybe just an hour long. You're staying inside of the state you're in. He's, uh, he's bought you a bag of chips and a, and a bottle of soda. And you're sitting in the back of the, of the van, ignoring his presence entirely. Wrapped in your own world. Maybe reading a, a novel by Stephen King or, or, or Clive Barker or someone like that. Just some, um... Uh, underestimatable, uh, not entirely, um, not entirely literary writer, uh, who's just peddling what some people might interpret to be cheap, traditional, although quasi-traditional, since it's after the gothic period of horror, 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 horror. That itself is a loop. That, that's, a, that's a loop of situational horror. The fact that, that I would have to specify three times in a row, or, or at least defend by saying it over and over, to make clear my meaning by saying horror, horror, and not trying to sound like an idiot by saying the same word twice, as a, and seeming like I just don't know any other words. I've been saying horror quite a bit. And that is, again, because I haven't found a new name. It will be vital to find a new name and leave horror where it rightfully belongs as nothing more than a modifying descriptor or a noun, horrifying or horror itself, as, as an emotion. Because that's all horror is. Horror is not a genre. Horror is an emotion. These are not my words. These are, this is a quote from someone in the Splatterpunks anthology, but I agree with it wholeheartedly. Um, and with this emotion comes the key to why these things, the things I'm talking about, are also horror. Also are the rightful heirs to the pinnacle of, the, of my personal year, from my perspective, which is fall, autumn, the Halloween season, the month of October in particular, and everything that comes with that. With that, I end this installment of the Autumnus, and I hope you all are enjoying the crisp, chill air as it continues to drift into your bedrooms, through your open windows, and whisk past your ears as you're walking down the sidewalks of your relatively safe inhabitant and habitats, habitats, your habitats, your towns, your cities, your villages. So that's it. Until the next time.